and in dietetics researchship at Bath State University. And he specializes in diabetes education and weight loss. He served in the Seattle community for the past three years. And he's excited to bring his education experience to us. And, um, and so one of the questions that I had in looking at the happiness project, happy food, family, friends, all of these things help to make us happy. When, and when we gather together around the table and dream, um, it's the time to share our stories and open up and, and learn from one another. And I think that was done so much in my family. My sister and I were trying to remember, did we have, did we have discussions at the table? Did, did our parents ask us questions about school? I don't remember very much of that at all. It was more like, you know, eat that tongue that we prepared with the, um, the cherry sauce on top. And the kids are going, ugh. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, so we have, I think food is so important in, in the education of the child. And what what we do with little children is we try to introduce them to new foods that they have had an experience before, or give them something that they're familiar with and move from that into something more complex, and to see what their feelings are about that. But then we can look deeper now, today, because we have technologies today that we didn't have before when we were teaching. We're coming onto the threshold of something really grand because we're studying human development. And we can study the effects of food on our bodies. And so Matt has um, much to tell us about how that connects so that we can be, what's the word, so that we can help not hinder the production of neurotransmitters and hormones because it is so important for us to know these things. And as we sit down with our families and we eat with them, we give you something to think about that's beyond just the food in front of your face. And you'll know what's going on. And you'll be inspired by that. I know. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Uh, so first off, I, I do want to apologize for how this looks. For some reason, I decided to cut off the edges. Um, hopefully, everybody has a packet of all the slides on them. So, because I'm important words, um, let me know, and hopefully, we'll be right in front of you. So, as Gail mentioned, my name is Matt. And what I do here is I do the uh, nutrition and the culinary education. So, everything that we do with what we saw in the kitchen earlier is a lot of the way So, I would like to start off with just kind of what I really want to impart to everybody today. And the first part of this is to understand how some ways of how food is regulated in the body. Now, the body is a very complex thing, and we're going to be doing more of an overview rather than looking in depth at any one specific thing. Uh, so we'll be doing a, mostly uh, about neurotransmitters and, and how they actually affect mood. Um, and then understanding how the food is intertwined with neurotransmitter production. And then aside from looking at, okay, we know how the food works with this, now think of the practical application of how do we eat and who we eat with and how does that affect things as well. So to start off, and I'm glad I didn't hear any groans when I got to this slide. Uh, this is, again, because I don't know everyone's background, just to give a little uh, review of how the body works a little bit, just to make sure we're all on the same page. The first part of that, because this is a lot of what this is about, is what is a neurotransmitter? The simplest form of that is it's a chemical that's released by neurons, and we'll get into that in a minute, uh, that carries on or stops a message. And everything in your body functions because of relay messages from your neurons. So when these are not working properly, it's not just about mood, it's about I may not be able to function, I may not be able to grip things, I, my organs may not be able to work. So this is involved in everything that your body does. There are two graphs, or two pictures, excuse me, that I, I really like everyone to kind of keep in mind as we go through this. And this is one of them. Hopefully you got, oh good, you got a little bit. So just take a look around at what those different neurotransmitters do. Uh, I'll be talking about one more in addition to this, but look at all the things that it actually affects, and then think about if these systems are not working properly, how is that going to affect learning, and how is that going to affect just paying attention throughout the day? <coughs> Anyone see correlations with 
alertness, concentration, energy, just the first three of the time. So this is what we're going to be talking about. And um, the next graphic will be coming up in a minute, but it's more just having enough, not having too much, not having too little. So there's going to be kind of an efficiency marker here as well. So starting off with what a neurotransmitter does. There are two basic types, which are excitatory and inhibitory. So excitatory means it will pass a message along. Inhibitory means it will stop that message. And what I wanted to do for this was have a little activity um, involving balls and throwing them around, but I know we're all adults. I still kind of figured that might have gotten a little out of hand, so I refrained against doing that. Um, but what I what I want to kind of impart here is this idea of uh, the last, the last bullet that I have up here of synaptic threshold. What happens is I'm going to use my manual laser pointer, uh, and you can kind of see it on here. So there are two main parts of a neuron that we just really need to know for this. There's the axon right here. That's the part coming off of a neuron that attaches to a dendrite. That's another smaller part on a different neuron. And it doesn't quite attach. You can see that there is a space in between. The space in between is called a synapse. That's where all of those chemical messages happen. So what we have here is little receptors. And you can see that the end of the axon releases these chemicals in there, and they attach to those receptors. Now, the synaptic threshold is basically just, uh, say we have 100 of these receptors. And for this particular message to go on, 75 of those receptors need to be filled with dopamine. If 75 are not filled, that means the message will not go on. So it, it's not, it's an all or nothing thing. There is no kind of gradient here. It's either this will hit that mark or it will not. So for something like this, then this is where the, the, is where the activity is going to come in. We're going to have different colored balls. Let's say over here, red and green. And then we're just going to have people over here catching. And you're just throwing the balls over and you can see how many people caught them, which would kind of represent how many of those uh, receptors were actually filled. And then we would count and say, OK, we got 10 green and 12 red. The message does not go on. That's kind of a similar way to how this works. So what you have in there are also enzymes that break these things down. Uh, because if you pass it to a receptor, you don't want it to stay there forever, otherwise whatever signal is being passed on just continually goes. And producing too much of something, producing too little of something means that these messages are going to be impeded or sent on more often than they should. So this is kind of where a lot of mood disorders come in, where they're, you know, people talk about the chemical imbalance, imbalance. That's kind of what they do. Yes? Sorry, question. You um, said 75 out of 100, and I don't know, is it usually about 75%? No, it is, that was just a, a random number. Mm -hmm. um, it's basically the idea that it needs to meet this threshold, whatever that happens to be. I don't, I don't know what the number is. And is it individual for each person, depending on your unique brain, or is it individual for your transmitter? It's individual depending on the signal. So depending on what, so it's something that... that like hot? Yeah. Hot would probably not, and you might be able to speak to this more so than me, but hot would probably not need as many receptors filled because you want to keep your hand away from that heat as soon as possible. Um, more so for what I showed before with how this does really affect your mood. You know, those may not necessarily be uh, like, okay, I need five filled. They may be, I need 50 filled. So, um, so those work a, a little bit differently. And I would also like to say that uh, I'm not a neurobiologist, so all of the detail of this, you know, starting to go down the rabbit hole, it's a, we can just keep going down the rabbit hole? Yeah, just, just wondering things. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so where was that? Was that synaptic threshold? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, so, so with that, it's impeded or stopped. And like I said before, they don't just sit there. So after the neurotransmitter does its job, it, you need to do something with it. It's in that receptor, it's, it's kind of right here. Um, we have enzymes that break these things down because you don't want it just sitting there all the time. You want it to uh, just break apart. And what happens is the enzyme comes along, breaks up into its constituent parts, which are amino acids, which we'll talk about later, and they are reabsorbed by the neuron. 
And then once they're back in the neuron, they can be repackaged to another neurotransmitter, to be any kind of other protein that that cell needs. One of the problems with this also is that for people who make too much of a certain enzyme, they can break these things down too quickly. And that's also where mood impairment can happen. So, has anyone heard of an MAOI? Just a type of term. Okay, so it, it stands for monoamine oxidase inhibitor, which is not important. What is important is, this is for people who create too much of an enzyme that breaks down a certain neurotransmitter. Basically what's happening is, it's getting broken down in the synapse before it can even attach to the receptor. And then once it is in the receptor, it's getting broken down too much. So basically think of, if you can never fill up enough receptors for this to actually do its job. So what that drug does is it inhibits the enzyme that breaks it down, so that way, hopefully you are producing enough of it, and enough of it is allowed to attach to receptors to actually cause the correct signal to happen. Um, you know, the, the kind of food issue with that is that fermented foods you should not have when you're on an MAOI, because fermented foods have a lot of those monoamines in it, and if you're not breaking those down, then it's going too far the other way, and now suddenly you're making too much of this then. Yes, oh, I'm no, sorry, I just touched it. Okay. Yeah. If, if anyone does have questions along the way, please feel free to stop me. Yes? Uh, how does the uh, affect your immune system? The immune system? Yeah. If you're not firing enough, or this is having an effect on your immune system, if you have an immune deficiency disease? Immune deficiency disease would be more in that you're not producing enough white blood cells or, or other kind of helper cells. Um, so white blood cell production happens in the bone marrow, so it might have something to do with that, but maybe kind of vicariously. Typically it's more of a genetic thing. So this is the other, this one's very simple, I made this one myself. Uh, this is the other graph that I want everyone to keep in mind, and it did cut off a little bit here. Uh, so, and you do have in front of you, but I'll explain it. So over here is efficiency on the left, and efficiency basically means how well do you function? How alert are you? How, how well can you perform in class or to do these kinds of tasks that you as teachers are going to have your students go through? And then at the bottom is neurotransmitter production and stimulation. So you can see it's basically the outside on you that at the top, if you're producing enough of this and if you're producing enough throughout the day, then you will be as efficient as possible. If you're producing too little, your efficiency goes down. If you produce too much, your efficiency goes down as well. And kind of look at that right now, or it would be these types of symptoms that if you're producing too little dopamine, you can see there's a lot of attention deficit disorders, uh, depression, addiction. All of these have to do with these types of, uh, of disorders. So you can see one way or the other, there's going to be something going on where they're just not going to be mentally ready to absorb any of the knowledge that you're trying to impart to them. Now, the, uh, so the more happened that frame. This is basically adrenaline. So, I just yes, have a question. I'm looking at that and I'm thinking manic depressive. So that must mean there's fluctuations in the dopamine. And, and that's, yeah, so that's, that's an old term for uh, like what is sort of but is that, because I'm looking at too little, dopamine means that you get the top one, and too much is, is the one that's underneath. Mm -hmm. Is it separate from the bipolar disorder? Is there something going on with the food that's creating that? The, um, oh, are you looking at the mania, I'm looking at too your, much depression? Mm -hmm. uh, those would be separate. Uh, there are, so the next one, I believe, yeah, so too little, Okay, GABA, which is the other neurotransmitter I wanted to talk about. It doesn't matter what it stands for, but it's just another one that's involved in mood. Um, so that is one that, if you have too little of it, can cause bipolar tendencies. And you can see just how much of this, and part to bottom, uh, you can see how much of this is actually involved in our cognition throughout the day. Yes? So does this just have to do with production, or is it also the ability for it to connect to the receptor? It would be both. Uh, so, in thinking about this, too little is either you're producing too little, or you have too much of that enzyme that's breaking it down, and then it's acting as if you were producing too little anyway. Anyone else before I go? 
see a lot of concern faces. So I just want to make sure that, we're, that the groundwork is okay before we move on. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so now to my favorite topic. Um, how does e-food actually affect this? So, the, as I mentioned before, the neurotransmitters are made of certain things. They're made of amino acids, which is basically protein. These are the constituent parts of protein. And aside from that, you have, so you have, um, basically think of it like a sentence. Uh, an amino acid is a letter. So you have to string together these words to make the proper sentence, and if they're out of order, it won't work. Um, so we have to have them in the correct order, but the enzymes that create these also have to create them in the correct shape. And that's where everything below it comes in. The B vitamins, vitamin C, all kinds of minerals, magnesium, calcium, all kinds of other ones, are involved in those enzymes that actually create these neurotransmitters. So if we are deficient in any of those, that also means that we're not going to be producing enough. So it's not just an issue of eating enough amino acids, it's an issue of having everything your body needs to create this. And a lot of what that is are vitamins and minerals as well. Uh, the, the last one, so the antioxidants. This is, um, so peripherally it just means that antioxidants are not directly involved in neurotransmitter production they do help to decrease inflammation. So in keeping inflammation down, you can see with increased inflammation, dopamine goes down. Um, so inflammation can come from many different things. It can come from your diet, it can come from stress, it can come from uh, the environment around you. So if you are in, let's say, a highly stressful environment, if you are in, a, I don't want to say a toxic environment, but an environment where, let's just say, you're, you're close to a highway and you're breathing a lot of of exhausted, uh, the antioxidants can help to neutralize some of those things uh, and again kind of aid in normal production of everything that we need. These are, oh, that would be really good. Okay, so this one might be easier in the back end. Um, this, you don't need to worry about any of the names on top or the second row. Uh, those are just different amino acids. And amino acids come from protein. So different amino acids and what they lead to. So as you can see, tryptophan leads to serotonin, but serotonin also leads to melatonin. So if we are eating a diet that's low in tryptophan, we can't produce enough serotonin. And if we can't produce enough serotonin, then we're not going to make enough melatonin from it. And melatonin is involved in sleep cycles. So if and hopefully everyone's feeling nice and full today. So, so after Thanksgiving dinner, how does everyone feel? Tired? Yeah. So part of that has to do with the tryptophan in the turkey. There is, um, there's actually quite a bit of tryptophan in bananas as well, which um, works a little bit differently. So the tryptophan that's in turkey, you're, you're eating basically protein. You're eating amino acids. And what happens with that is you eat these amino acids, they get you know, broken apart and they get absorbed into your blood. Now they're all trying to compete because they share receptors in your brain to cross that blood-brain barrier. Um, they're all trying to compete, so only a few can get in. Um, if you eat carbohydrates with it, like in the case of a banana, the carbohydrates can signal an insulin response, which opens up our cells so sugar can go in. And when they do that, a lot of the other amino acids kind of follow behind it. Tryptophan is not one of them. So if you have it with carbohydrates, you have all these amino acids floating around in the blood, you have carbohydrates coming in, you have insulin opening the cells, and the amino acids flood into the cells, except for tryptophan. So that's left with basically no competition to cross the blood brain barrier. So that means if you're eating just turkey, you're not going to absorb as much tryptophan into your brain as if you're eating turkey and, let's say, mashed potatoes and stuffing. So that kind of helps with the nice thing. Part of it is the social environment where you know, you're having a lot of wine, Relaxing the family. Hopefully, you're relaxing the family, although you know, it usually ends up in a fight. But for the most part, you know, after the fight's over and everyone's made up, you know, you get to relax with family. And that is also helping to bring about that feeling of, oh, okay, I feel contented and relaxed. Now, imbalances can come from 
different things. So part of it, it could be from the diet. Uh, it could be just an inborn error where, as we mentioned before, you're making too much of an enzyme or you're not making enough neurotransmitter. So if it is because of the diet, there are certain specific things that can help to produce this. But as we mentioned with the, with the different amino acids and kind of how it all works together, um, the too rapid neurotransmitter breakdown, with what we mentioned before with uh, drugs can really help to uh, not produce that so much, they can actually do a job. And then the inflammation as well, where eating antioxidants and eating a lot of things that can help decrease inflammation will also help if kind of dopamine is a little out of balance. This one I wanted to bring up because, and this is emerging research. So the past five years or so, there's been a lot coming out about how the gut and the brain kind of talk to each other. And there's nothing definitive or conclusive yet, but in the next 10 years, we're going to be a lot of teased out about this and we can say, this is what causes that. Um, one of the things that they do know right now is that 90% of the serotonin in our body is produced in our gut by the bacteria living in our gut. And more so than that, the serotonin that is produced there is absorbed into the bloodstream and will make it to the brain. So it's not just what we eat, it's also what the bacteria eats. So has anyone heard of probiotics and prebiotics? Does anyone know the difference? It can be, it can be tricky. So the simplest thing is a probiotic. Think of something like yogurt, something that has active cultures in it. Probiotic just means the bacteria itself. A prebiotic is anything that the bacteria eats. And this would be uh, in the simplest form, principles. Because when, when we eat something with fiber in it, what happens is you know, we extract the nutrients that we can, but then the rest of it that we can't eat, you know, the fiber specifically, goes to uh, our large intestine. And that's where the bacteria eat all of that. So we don't digest it, they do. They produce serotonin for us, which again, can kind of help keep our levels where they should be. They also produce uh, about 50% of the vitamin K that we need throughout the day. They produce the vitamins, they produce healthy fatty acids for us as well that is absorbed directly from the colon. Um, so it's not just the mood. What they're really finding out is that the bacteria in your gut plays a big part in not just your cognition and your mood, but also in <coughs> your body type as well. They have done experiments in mice and they're starting to do some people where they do what's called a uh, fecal transfer where they will take, they will have unhealthy mice, and they will have healthy mice, and they will take the bacterial colonies from the healthy mice and inject them into the unhealthy mice, and in a couple of weeks' time, those of these mice, they're thin, and they look at all the markers that they're looking for, for inflammation, for you know, blood triglycerides, and they all come down. Yes? Yeah, so, so um, is, is that why things like kombucha and kimchi and sauerkraut fermented foods now are kind of all the craze because you're balancing the good and bad um, flora, gut bacteria. And and because you, you need a, a certain amount of what we would call, I guess, the bad, because it can't be all good. You don't necessarily need the bad. Uh, they're going to be there anyway. Mm -hmm. you, I mean, you'll never get rid of them. It's more just which colony is the majority colony. So, and, and fermented foods, like you said, I think that's part of why they're starting to come and build more. Um, fermented foods themselves um, are not enough to actually repopulate our gut. So if anybody is, has been on antibiotics recently, or if, um, if you ate something bad and you had that area, I mean, a lot of what comes out of that is our bacterial colony. That's the time where you would need to repopulate it. Food itself is most likely not, it doesn't have enough colonies in it to actually start that population again. Um, that's where uh, pills come in handy, but if doctors are starting to prescribe after antibiotics, they'll give probiotic pills to help put that bacteria back in place. Do some people take that as part of their daily supplement? I don't know, I don't know if they take it as, as a daily supplement only because um, it would be more I mean, it's a possibility. I haven't heard of it more. Okay. Yes? It kind of depends on how much you know about this and how much you monitor your intake. If you eat uh, 
artificial sweeteners, for example, they're hard on your bacteria, so it's a good thing to have some probiotics uh, with that. The sugar alcohols can be a little bit, it depends on the artificial sweetener too. Something like Splenda, it's, it's a sugar molecule with two chlorine atoms attached to it, so it, basically they're just changing the shape so that none of our receptors recognize it. Um, so that it's, ne it's never actually absorbed. I don't know if the bacteria actually eat that or not, but I don't believe so. Probably chlorine is an antibacterial element. That, so that it is, you but probably you, don't want to get too much chlorine. Because it's bound to the sugar, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't get released. So if it were more chlorine in the water, that would be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And typically something like that would absorb a lot of that uh, in, the, in our stomach and in the small intestine. So hopefully a lot of that would be out before it gets to where our bacteria colonies are. Uh, oh, the oh, last part about this is stress. Mild stress can even induce the growth of bad bacteria. And this is something that is hard for a lot of people because some of these symptoms that people have is just from stress. And honestly, the only way to deal with that is learning how to deal with stress. Kind of what, what you were mentioning before about you know, having, basically trying to help people grow into healthy adults. Mentally and physically, and the other mental part of that is not so much getting stressed out of your life because it will never be out. It's how do you deal with stress when it comes up? Because it does have a big impact on our health. So, meal so, patterns. So this is okay. Comfort food. What's everyone's favorite comfort food? Just go. Bread, bread, mac and cheese, chocolate. I like pizza. Um, so these comfort food is called comfort food for a reason. There is an actual pleasure response in our brains from eating, especially carbohydrates, because when we were evolving, there weren't very many concentrated sources of it. So they go from our Stone Age ancestors and they come across a uh, hive, uh, and let's just say the bees are out, so you don't worry about these things. Um, you come across honey, you're going to eat as much as you possibly can, because who knows when you're going to find it again. And our bodies are very efficient at turning carbohydrates into fat. Because if you don't know where your next meal is coming from, you want to make sure that any energy you have, you can store it right away and use it for later for those famine times. Uh, and this is so with the meal patterns, this is basically just eating consistently throughout the day. And what that means is, you know, three meals. It might mean three meals and a couple snacks. But basically, think of if you had if you had a very large breakfast. Blood sugar is going to be going up, and then it'll come back down pretty quick if it's something like McDonald's. Um, and then what happens is when you get to those lows, that's when you start to feel the next bullet point, which is angry, if everyone's familiar with that term. Combination of hungry and angry, I get that a lot when I'm hiking and I don't have enough food. Yeah, so this is also when your blood sugar gets too low and irritability and just lack of any real. First thing, I have lack of any. <laughs> Any constructive way of making a decision. Yeah. I can make a decision, but it's not always a constructive one. <laughs> um, so those are the things that can happen when blood sugar gets too low. So in eating consistently throughout the day, instead of blood sugar spiking and falling, you kind of have like a mild roller coaster. Think about the gentle rolling hills rather than riding through the Himalayas. Mm -hmm. And this also comes with uh, sleep and exercise. You know, all these patterns are important that if we don't get enough sleep, I mean, we saw before that serotonin, some of that will turn into melatonin, which um, regulates our sleep cycle. So if there's not enough of either one, both of those are going to be thrown off. This one I will actually skip because we're not incredible to have enough time for it. So we'll go to this. So one of the practical, practical side of this is kind of what I talked about right there, the uh, blood sugar control. So you can see the stickers bar. You get a lot of energy right away, but then it's coming down, it's coming down. And right about here, you be hangry. If you eat a more balanced meal or a snack, like an apple, you can see it kind of stays in that upper range, goes up more slowly, comes down more slowly. And the thing about it, right, now for, this is produced by the USDA, and you know, without getting into a conversation about the USDA, <laughs> this, is, this is actually one thing that is a pretty good general tool. And it's really easy to visualize it. You have your plate. You fill up half of it with fruits and vegetables. You fill up a quarter of it with some kind of protein, whether it's animal or non-animal protein. And then 
And I don't like that they had grains here. This should be starch. So it doesn't necessarily, it could be potatoes. It could be just any kind of starch that you want. Um, the grains kind of, go, kind of goes into the whole political aspect of you know, some of the influences of USDA. But it's just any kind of starch. So this is a really simple way to visualize a healthy meal. And we kind of had it with the, with the sandwiches as well. This is that and turning it into a sandwich. That we had two pieces of bread. We had the lettuce, which was a little bit, so it wasn't half the plate. Um, and then we had the meat. So it's kind of that idea of having a little variety and also trying to make as much as possible uh, some non-protein or non-animal sources. Has anyone seen the Eat Your Rainbow for kids? So that, that's also another one that um, that is a pretty good visual. That in eating a rainbow, what they're basically saying is eat different colors because different colored fruits and vegetables have different vitamins and minerals in it. So if you eat enough variety of colors, you're going to be getting anything you need. Uh, is it? Yeah. What about the um, different kinds of fats? Like so, the added. So for, for fats specifically, a good general rule of thumb is if it's solid at room temperature, it's a saturated fat. If it's liquid, it's an unsaturated fat. Uh, to break down the liquid more, there are healthier fats. So what we look for healthy fats is the presence of omega-3 fatty acids, which would be something like olive oil, which would be something like, in the market, is, is camelino oil. They're high in omega 3s, and what that means is they are anti inflammatory. So they also go along with breaking down the inflammation that we just create naturally in our body. Ones that have more omega 6 fatty acids, those are going to be pro inflammatory. And uh, to put that in perspective a little bit, the, uh, it's more of the ratio. So olive oil doesn't have that much omega 3 in it compared to canola. But canola has way more omega-6, so the ratio is really out of balance, so it's considered more of a pro-inflammatory oil. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. I just wanted to comment about your the plate, and I was just to say yeah. that I really like the Harvard Healthy Eating Plate, because that one also includes, it has a picture, so it looks the same, except it does say whole grains, healthy protein, and then it has a small bottle on the side that says, oils and fats, mm -hmm. and then instead of the dairy for the drink, it shows water. Which, I, I, I try to find one specifically without the dairy, yeah, but, sure. so, but you don't necessarily. So Harvard shows water, and then oh. it also mentions exercise. Mm -hmm. So because there's so much political stuff with the My Plate, yeah. um, and I, anyways, I that, no, that would have been a, a much yeah. better but, the, but I really yeah. like I really like the Harvard because you know we get so many mixed messages about fats, and I really, you need fats, and these are the yeah. ones that you want to start incorporating into your diet. The fat isn't evil, right? It's how we use it. Exactly. And, and, and the same thing with everything. I mean, it, it's kind of, it's kind of strange to see how cyclic these things go, that you know, protein was demonized, and then carbs were demonized, and then fats demonized, and now carbs are again. It just goes in cycles. And the underlying recommendations for the last 50 years for dietitians have been kind of this, of just eat food. You know, you make most of it fruits and vegetables, eat a lot of plants, have some animal in there if you want to, but just eat food. You don't need to have packaged stuff, but it's not, it doesn't sell a lot of books. So it's kind of hard to keep up with everything that's coming out, and the recommendations have stayed more or less the same for the last 50 years, just for the general healthy population. Okay, so all these cycles getting out of balance, uh, and I want to get quickly to the next part. So all these cycles getting out of balance, um, Aside from the, that kind of hunger feeling, also think of the neurotransmitter imbalance if you're not eating enough of one or the other, that those are the things that it can lead to. And I'm sure everyone has seen that from time to time in the classroom of kids not focusing, kids having trouble controlling their emotions, you know, just stressful situations for kids too. Uh, this one I will skip over as well. The, the um, basics of this is having breakfast. Uh, to start off the day it really does help with focus and concentration. Um, they did a lot of this research in developing countries, uh, mainly Brazil, and what they found was the kids who were not well fed did a lot better in eating breakfast. The kids who were already well fed, to go kind of typical Western, 
um, or not typical listing, right? But think of just somebody who does eat regularly. They still did better, but it was diminishing returns. So how that really affects a lot of kids here who may be overfed but undernourished, which basically means you'd be eating a lot of junk food, so you're getting the calories, but not necessarily the vitamins. Um, I, I have not seen any research on that, so I don't know how well this translates to some of our kids here. Okay, so I'm just going to show a quick video about this is going on in the Highline District. And of course, we have an ad, so we can just look at this ad. Find endless adventure in the San Juan Islands. You can also go to San Juan. It's original for the seasons. Go to visitsanjuan.com. This week, we are letting people weigh in on obesity. On all King 5 platforms, we're taking a look at the challenges from nutrition to an active lifestyle. Tonight, we're focusing on what schools are doing about the problem. The Highline District has changed when and where students eat. And as King 5 Drew Mickelson shows us, a school near you might do the same. I noticed Miguel taking care of his morning job. Students from White Center Heights Elementary show up ready to learn yeah. and to eat. If your basic needs aren't being met, you can't focus on academics in the classroom. For the last two years, they've been letting the kids eat free breakfast during the first 15 minutes of class. Put your name on the board for now. Fifth grade teacher Grace Friedman has noticed a change. In previous schools where we've had that long period in the morning, it's been really challenging to maintain focus, and students often complain about being hungry, and that isn't the case for this Freeman's class had whole grain chocolate chip pancakes, fat free or 1% white milk. The nutrition services manager for Highline Schools says before breakfast was served in class, only one third of low income students who qualified free breakfast ate the meals. A lot of students arrive late. Um, they come and they just don't have time, but they'd rather go out and play with their friends and come in and get breakfast. <laughs> now, almost all of the students who can have a free breakfast get one. Skipping meals leads to weight gain. If the kids go home hungry, they're more likely to fill up on sugary snacks. They've also changed the way they do research. Most schools had it after lunch. The majority of highlighted schools switched up the order. So instead of kids rushing through or skipping their meals to go to play, they eat after recess. If you give them the opportunity to spend 20 minutes in the lunchroom eating and slowing down, it's a lot easier to go back into the classroom and to learn. Do you need another color ground? Teachers say changing where and when students eat make for more productive school days at White Center Heights. It brings in a sense of calm, if that makes sense. The district says these lessons the kids are learning will last long after the bell. You really need to get at kids and instill healthy eating habits when they're younger and that those will last a lifetime. Absolutely. Show me a sign of life at the door. Drew Mickelson, K5. Absolutely. Expanding breakfast after the bell programs around the state is part of Governor James' Lee. Right, so that is one way in which uh, some schools, the Highline School District, especially are, are trying to really figure out how do we get kids ready for the day. And also, I like the switch between recess being before lunch, which is great because I, I used to do the same thing. Yeah, so such a simple yeah. change. And that's where, and that's honestly a lot of when I was doing outpatient counseling, that's a lot of what it would come down to. Of if you just switch these two things in the day, how would that work out? You know, it could be working out before dinner, it could be you know, whatever it happens to be, but those small changes really made a big difference. So family meals. Now, this part, the uh, nutritional implications of having meals together. So nothing about Thanksgiving dinner because that's a little bit different. Uh, but with, with just sitting down with family meals, it, it's slower eating. Uh, because it really does take our minds about 20 minutes to figure out that there's something in your stomach. And I grew up with brothers and sisters, so I had to eat before it was gone. <laughs> and I don't know about else, but I could eat a lot in 20 minutes, and then 30 minutes later, you realize, oh, that was too much. Mm -hmm. So slowing down the eating can really help with not overeating. Uh, but also, there's a greater chance for kids to have exposure to new foods. Not just kids, but adults, too. The more we see a food, the more likely we are to try it, especially if we see other people eating it. Mm -hmm. Where it's on the table, you don't have to force it on them, but you can see the problem. Uh, and then an opportunity to learn good eating habits. So this comes into modeling, not just uh, at home, but 
if anybody here you know, has meals in the classroom with their kids, modeling that good eating uh, can really be beneficial because that at first, up to about, kind of up to about school days, uh, kids do model their eating habits on the father for the most part. I don't know why it's the father. I don't know. Because mom eats those grains and the one one. I don't know why it's the father, but that's what they're supposed to show my kids model it on the father and more so than the mother. Um, and then once they get to more school age, they start to model it more on their peers. So the one thing that can be controlled in the classroom, if you are kind of eating when the kids are eating, is if you're modeling good eating habits, hopefully at least some of the kids can see it and start through them because you never know what kind of changes that can make for their eating habits. Um, also, getting kids involved in the kitchen early is never a bad thing. I love seeing kids come to the kitchen here, especially when we have field trips come through, because we'll have them eat foods that they never would normally eat because we've said, this is what's on our farm, this is what we're going to make today, you're going to help. And because they had a hand in it, they're more likely to try it as well. And a lot of times they end up liking it, which is the nice thing. So I'm going to have a couple of a little, little time. We'll start a little bit, so bear with me, please. Uh, so the research that I found for family meals and kind of psychosocial well-being, this is a lot of what it said, is it'll decrease incident of risky behavior, which is kind of defined as substance abuse and dopamine behaviors. Higher academic achievement of their eating habits and the higher psychosocial well-being. But I want to post this to everyone. Else. What are some questions that come up when you think about if there's a core? Yeah. Okay, so um, especially with like healthier eating habits, Person, but that student, you know, it's 
not okay to eat that because it's not healthy for your body, but at the same time, I understand that that's what your parent taught you because that's all I could afford, or I don't know. You know, so it's what you liked. Exactly. We had an infestation of rats at Ballard once when, before the new school was built, and the rats would not eat the Cheetos or Doritos under the couch. <laughs> but they ate the thumbs out of the oven mitts and the beans I had the bean bags to make games for child development. So there you go. <laughs> the rats only eat it. <laughs> but you put that as a YouTube video because that only ends on YouTube. It's yeah. true. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Any questions? 
Yes. Do you have a reliable resource that would have the nutrition and maybe help help with ADHD? So teaching kindergartners on students that nine years of the medication may not be the right job for them. So the low cost nutrition can help maybe make that better. The uh, for for a lot of students, uh, eat right dot org. It is the uh, eat right dot org. So this is the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics which is kind of my licensing body. They have a lot of, they have kind of a, a library of a lot of these questions and how does nutrition affect this? So whether it's ADHD or kind of any other, any other really uh, issue, it will have something about this. Yes. Could you repeat that website? Uh, eat right, R-I-G-H-T dot org. Sorry, I went a little over time, but if anybody does have any questions, um, or if you'd just like to discuss anything, uh, please let me know. I would be here until about four. Yes. Could you send us that PowerPoint, uh, too? I'm sorry? Could you send us that PowerPoint? Sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, I can send it to Gail. And, uh, Gail, do you have people's mm -hmm. emails? Mm -hmm. You know, I might not have everyone's, but we no, just pass it out to Gail. We just collected the whole chat. Yeah. Yeah. This one. So if you didn't sign this one, I'll pass it to you. So then, I think I'm going to send to you specifically. I'll send it to Gail uh, as well, and so she can, if anybody asks, she can send it. Anything else? Everyone full and happy? <laughs> right. Like set up. Thanks for doing that. Yeah, what I'll do is I think I have your email. Okay. And what I'll, I think I got from this is, and what I've done in the past with these big guys is put them on Dropbox. Oh, yeah, and yeah. And it takes a while to get done. Now, we can transfer several different ways to do it, and uh, we'll, have to, we'll have to get it to you. Okay. That's the plan. Well, that's, that's great. I, appreci I appreciate it. Well, it's an interesting opportunity for me. It's fun. I'm doing this. 